Do you want to listen to lectures without having your phone on? Get the One Islam TV app today, available on these platforms. Grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal. Today we will discuss a topic that I have mentioned many times in my lectures in passing, but today we're going to shed a little bit of extra light, and it is especially relevant given the circumstances right now in Gaza and in Palestine, and that is our history as a Muslim Ummah, our relationship with the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years before the creation of, of Israel, for the last 15 centuries. Because the fact of the matter is, that it is truly sad in light of our contributions to the survival and the flourishing of this demographics that they seem to ignore and neglect all of these centuries of positive interactions. Because the fact of the matter, once again, Christian Europe treated this demographics in a very different way than we did. And multiple times in history, the Muslim Ummah and the Muslim civilization played a vital role in protecting hundreds of thousands of persecuted Jewish people. So we need to be aware of this and we need to know our own history. And again, only so much can be said for the history of 15 centuries. But as you're roughly aware, we went over this in detail, this earlier part in a number of lectures. In the year 70 CE, in the time of Jesus Christ, after Jesus Christ, the second temple was destroyed, and so Judaism once again had its diaspora. They fled across the globe, so they didn't have a land. For the next 2,000 years, where were the Jewish people? Under Christian and then Muslim rule. For 1,500 years before 1947, 1,400 years before 1947, where were the Jewish people? either in Christian lands or in Muslim lands. Okay, what is the difference between how the Jewish people were treated in Christian lands versus how they were treated in Muslim lands? This is the summary we're going to be just discussing today. And of course, the goal is to pique your curiosity. The goal is to start you on the journey. Obviously, in 15, 20 minutes, only so much we can do. We need to understand Christianity from its inception has been extremely intolerant of the Jewish people. Why? Because according to their theology, what did the Jewish people do to their own God, to the Son of God? Well, according to their theology, what did they do? They murdered the Son of God. So from the beginning, there's a term that is found in Christian literature. I'm not inventing this term. It's called Christ killers. This is what they called the Jewish people, Christ killers. And that is why, generally speaking, in ancient Christianity, medieval Christianity, Jewish people were not treated as equal citizens. They didn't have the right to own property in most of European history. They were forced to live in special areas. The ancient term for this in Venice, the, the Venetian term is still used in English. Guess what that term is? Ghetto. That term ghetto, where does it come from? Now we use ghetto to mean what? a very poor, very impoverished part of the city. Well, it was called ghetto for the first time in Venice in the 1200s from a Venetian term to mean low class. It's literally a term that was used for Jewish people. The term ghetto in English comes from them having to live in a separate place of the city. Jewish people in Europe were prohibited from any noble profession. They had to take ignoble tasks. They were prohibited from owning land. They were prohibited from rising up in the ranks of nobility. In fact, the one job that they were not prohibited to do, and that's why they started to do this more and more, was the job that was prohibited by the church, and that is lending of money. The church said, you cannot lend money on interest. And Christians, if they do so, they're going to go to hell. They're going to be damned. This is Christian law, by the way. Jewish people were exempt because they're not Christian. And they couldn't work in so many other areas. This is not anti-Semitic. I'm teaching you history. This is a fact. Jewish people then took on, by and large, in Europe, the profession of money lending, charging interest. 
because they weren't allowed any other job they weren't allowed careers and this was prohibited by the church you'd be damned so what did they do they became the proto bankers the first bankers and so what's going to happen slowly but surely their wealth did increase this is not a, a anti-semitic it's the fact of the matter is that they were involved in this profession and that is why rich dynasties from this group did begin to rise in the 15th 16th 17th centuries but that's because they were the ones lending money. Eventually, the church had to buckle under pressure and change their law and say it is now allowed for Christians to do. Otherwise, Christians forbade Christians from lending money with interest. It was haram for them. The church would excommunicate you. That's why this group began to do this. In the 11th century, when the Crusades was announced, in 1095, 1096, the first Crusaders, they left England, they left Italy, they left France, and they made their way to Jerusalem, wanting to free, quote-unquote, Jerusalem from Muslim lands. Do you know what happened before they reached Jerusalem? They started massacring Jewish people. Where? In Europe. Why? What has that got to do with Jerusalem? They began to reason, if we're going to go to Jerusalem where Jesus walked, we should avenge his death before we get there. And so, thousands, this is the first time where pogroms happened against Jewish people. Entire cities in Europe, entire cities in Germany, this is in 1096, 1097, entire cities were decimated from their Jewish populations. It is really pathetic what the Christians did. The women and children ran to the synagogues begging for freedom, and they burnt the synagogue with babies in it. They burnt it. Who? The Christians. Why? Because these are Christ killers. I say this because you need to know where is this anger? Where is this anti-Semitic coming from? It's coming from Europe. We Muslims had nothing to do with any of this hatred. And you need to know the irony of how we can be accused when in reality this notion of anti-Semitism comes straight from Europe. In the year 1215, the church gave a decree that Jewish people could not live like normal citizens any Christian land. They had to wear a different clothing. They had to live in different places of the city. They had to have specific professions. This is the Vatican. This is the church normalizing the discrimination of Judaism. This is in 1215. Don't be surprised in a few decades, 1290, King Edward of England said, I don't want any of these people in my kingdom. So he made a decree to expel every single member of the Jewish faith from England. For 400 years, there were no Jewish people in England. 400 years. Why? Anti-Semitism. The king said, none of these people are going to be here. And Shakespeare writes his plays during this time. But the stereotype, the negative, evil stereotype remains in the psyche of Europe. Go read Shakespeare's plays. Go read how he writes about Shylock the Jew. This is Shakespeare, not me. Shakespeare is an anti-Semite in every sense of the term. The stereotypes, the negativity, and ironically, He's never interacted with the Jewish person because there are no Jews in England when Shakespeare's writing because of the decree. Only in 1680 or something, the king relents and allows them back in. And that is why, by the way, to this day in England, the Jewish population is very small compared to other places in Europe because for four centuries, they were banned. And one of the worst manifestations of anti-Semitism took place in Andalusia, but not under us, when Ferdinand and Isabella reconquered, reconquista, when they conquered uh, uh, Granada, the Muslim land, when they conquered Granada, the first decree, less than one week or one month after they took power, 1492, they made the decree. It's called the decree of Al-Hamra because it was in the Hamra palace. There shall be no Jewish people living in Andalusia. Hundreds of thousands of Jewish people were forced to convert to Christianity or were sent into exile. The entire population of Iberian Spain, and there were, we don't know, three, four hundred thousand, half a million Jewish people, they were either forced to convert under torture or they had to flee for their lives. And this is one of the worst manifestations. Now you get to Hitler in the 1930s and 1940s, which is, of course, the worst anti-Semitic outburst in all of human history. And this needs to be said bluntly. Hitler did not come in a vacuum. 
Hitler is tapping in to mainstream Christian notions of anti-Semitism. The term anti-Semite, the birth of anti-Semite, the notions of anti-Semite, it has nothing to do with Arabs and Muslims. It is European and Christian through and through, 100%. Even the term is invented by the Christians and used by the Christians. This is just a summary of Christian lands. Let's move on to Muslim lands. SubhanAllah, wherever Muslims went and there were Jewish people, the Jewish people faced a type of flourishing. They were given a type of protection they could never find in Christian lands. And the, the, when Muslims conquered uh, what is currently Iraq, what is currently Iran, Iraq had a large population of Jews in Baghdad from the time of the first expulsion, not even the second, from yani, 500 BC, because the largest group of Jews from the first expulsion, they went to Iraq. So Muslims found large groups of Jews in Iraq. In Iran, Isfahan, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people, again from the first and second expulsion. And the Muslims came and found them and they gave them protection under the treaty of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Jerusalem, when Umar ibn al-Khattab marched into Jerusalem, guess how many Jewish people were there? Zero. Guess how many synagogues? Zero. Jews were not allowed to worship in Jerusalem under the Christians. Guess who gave them the freedom to build the first synagogue after the collapse of the temple? It was none other than Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Umar ibn al-Khattab acting upon Islamic commandments, acting upon prophetic guidelines. Jews and Christians are Ahli Kitab. They have the right to live freely. They have the right to worship. They have the right to build their synagogues and whatnot. Now, modern you know, liberals come along and they say, oh, the conditions of Umar al-Khattab are second-class citizenship. I'm not going to claim that Umar radiallahu anh's condition is the same as secular America. It's not. But we're not comparing Umar ibn al-Khattab to secular America. Secular America is a different notion where, where religion plays no role. In the Islamic scheme of things, religion plays a vital role. So if you're a Muslim, yes, you get perks and, and, and privileges, no doubt about that. And if you're Ahli Kitab, there's certain things. For example, you cannot convert people to your faith. For example, the, uh, the, the synagogue uh, um, uh, minaret or the temple, the temple and the synagogue cannot be higher than the minaret of the mosque. I ag agree these are conditions, but we're not comparing Umar ibn al-Khattab to modern liberalism. We're comparing Umar ibn al-Khattab to the rest of the world. The fact of the matter, never once in all of Islamic history was there a policy to kill all Jews? Was there a policy to persecute all Jews? Was there a policy to expel all Jews? So Umar al Khattab radiallahu an allowed the Jewish people to come back into Jerusalem. This is the first time they could come back and build the first synagogue under the Khulafa al Rashidun. And the rest, as they say, is history. That in Baghdad, when the Abbasids made their Baytul Hikmah, you know, the famous house of wisdom, they hired the most competent translators regardless of their background. And because Muslim people weren't studying ancient Greek and whatnot, some of the best translators were from a Jewish background because they're the ones studying ancient Greek, ancient Latin. And so Baytul Hikmah, hired the top Jewish minds to be in charge of the House of Wisdom. And when the Fatimids and when the Umayyads of Spain instituted their own Baytul Hikmah because they wanted to compete, there are three Khilafas, they wanted to compete with one another. So they made their own institutes of publishing. They also hired the best and brightest minds regardless of their background. Jews and Christians were at the top of this list. You have to understand why. Muslims weren't studying ancient Greek and whatnot. These civilizations were. So the Khulafa and the Sultans hired these people and gave them the best salary so that they can work with them. And one of the most interesting examples in our own history in Andalusia was under the Ta'ifa kingdom of Granada in around 1000, yani 1030 CE, like basically literally uh, 1000 years ago, literally 1000 years ago, the prime minister of Granada, the Sultan was Muslim, the prime minister was a rabbi and his name is Ismail ibn Nagrilla, Nagrilla, Ismail ibn Nagrilla. And he was a rabbi he was a learned man. He rose in the ranks until he became the prime minister of Qurtuba. 
this is a Jewish person and the people loved and respected him the Muslim population loved and respected him the books of history mention that when the Reconquista began because Reconquista took 500 years right when it first began Ibn Nagrilla this Jewish vizier was leading the Muslim army in jihad to defend Qurtuba against the Crusaders can you believe this? And because in those times, everybody dressed up in a particular garb, they wore Quranic uh, you know, um, uh, talismans for the time. Ibn Nagrilla, it is said, wore the Quranic coat of armor, verses of the Quran, and he's leading the Muslims in actual jihad against the Christians who are invading against Qurtuba, and he defends and he wins and he protects Qurtuba. So this is the reality of Jewish life under the uh, rule. Now, some people point out that 20 years later, a mini massacre occurs. And this you have to be careful, sisters and brothers. When you read these types of things, do your research. Do your research. It is true, a mini massacre occurred against the Jews of Qurtuba. But why? I'll tell you why. You won't find this too often because people just want to say, oh, the Muslims rebelled and they massacred hundreds of Jewish people in, in Qurtuba. It's true. But I'll tell you the story. This guy, Ibn Nagrilla, he died and he was buried with honors. His son, 21 years old, was given the next viziership as an honor that your father was the vizier, you become the vizier. His son is Yusuf ibn Nagrilla. Yusuf turned out to be a traitor. And the first thing he does, he writes a letter to the next kingdom. If you invade on such and such a date, I'll make sure you, you, you win over the kingdom, I'll distract the army and whatnot, but there's one condition, you must make me the ruler and I'll pay taxes to you, okay? So this guy, Yusuf, he attempted a coup d'etat. And he got his people to support him. And obviously his people were of a Jewish background. The letter was uncovered. The Muslims went wild. Mobs attacked the palace and literally shredded Ibn Nagrilla Yusuf, the son of the famous one. They literally shredded him and, and you know, tortured him to death. And then they turned on his core, killed him, them. And then it is true, sad, the mobs turned on the Jewish quarter because they thought this was a Jewish revolt against the city and innocent people lost their lives. But the point is, no Sultan gave the command, no government instituted this. And the reason why it happened was not because they were Jewish. It because, it's because the notion came that the entire community is treacherous to us. That's why this happened. Then things went back to normal and Jewish communities began to flourish within 150 years. The greatest Jewish mind in all of Jewish history was born and raised and studied in Qurtuba. Who is this person? Who can tell me? Musa ibn Maymun. Rambam is what the Jew Jewish people call him. The holy rabbi, Rambam, memorize this name. That's a title, honorific title. Musa ibn Maymun, Moses Maimonides. In the entire history of Judaism, there is no theologian that is more respected and venerated than Rambam. Rambam, Moses Maimonides, born and raised in Qurtuba, traveled the Muslim world, died and is buried in Egypt, in Cairo. He spoke fluent Arabic. He went through the madrasa systems. In those days, if you wanted to study, you went to the madrasa, right? And the madrasa is religious. So you study the sciences along with Quran and tafsir and hadith and fiqh. So Musa ibn Maymun, as a Jewish student, was not just given the freedom, he excelled in his studies. And his biographers mentioned this. I'm not making this up. Read his modern day biography. He lived like a Muslim, prayed like a Muslim, recited Quran like a Muslim. Nobody forced him. It was free. Andalusia, you could be who you are. But he was in such awe of Islam that some people say he secretly converted for a few years. Allahu alam. But he lived like a Muslim in the dorms. And there was no pressure because in Andalusia, there was a type of religious freedom that was not found anywhere in Europe. You could be a Christian, you could be a Jew, you could be a Zoroastrian, you could be a Muslim, and everybody lived freely in Andalusia. But Rambam decided to act like and memorize the Quran like a Muslim. Eventually, he goes back to his rabbi, you know, a pro a a profession, and he begins writing. Now, this deserves an entire lecture. I don't have time to get into there, but it is one of my areas that I love to read about because intellectual history is my area. Moses Maimonides, listen, I'll just summarize it. 
he took Islamic concepts and he Judaized them. Mainstream Judaism is influenced by Moses Maimonides and Moses Maimonides is influenced by Islamic thought. Now this is not a conspiracy again. Look this up. In fact, there's an entire entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia. I just saw this today to make sure that I can reference to you. The Stanford Encyclopedia Online, which is one of the most largest online encyclopedias. The Stanford Encyclopedia of, of, of Intellectual Thought has an entire article, The Islamic Influences on Moses Maimonides. And of them, his proofs for the existence of God, his concept of God is coming straight out of Al-Farabi Al-Kindi. His notion of prophethood and what is prophethood, his notion of even theology. Pause here, footnote. Sounds strange, I know. But Judaism, by and large, did not concentrate, did not care about belief. Judaism cared about what? What? Law. Judaism cared about how you act. It had almost nothing to do with Aqidah. That's why they don't have any book on Aqidah. The first book of, of Jewish theology, who wrote it? Rambam. The first book. And you read this book, and you are reading Al-Farabi, Al-Kindi. You are reading Islamic Mu'tazili thought. His conception of God, of the attributes, of Qadr, his conception of prophethood, it is coming straight out of his madrasa training. And this is now mainstream Jewish belief. I'm not making this up. This is well known. Mainstream Jewish theology is coming straight out of Andalusian Madrasa. He just changed it, you know, made it a little bit. And, so, and he wrote a creed. To this day, to this day, the righteous or the observant Jewish people, the first thing they do when they wake up, they read Moses Maimonides' one-page creed. And it begins... Ana mu'minu, I believe in, and I believe in, just like Aqidah Tahawiyah, just like other Aqidahs, it literally begins, I believe in, and there's 13 points. I believe in God, there is one, la sharika, la type of stuff, literally coming out of Islamic thought. He has no partner, cannot be described in this and that, literally goes through, and it goes all the way, and I believe in resurrection, I believe in the Messiah that's going to come, one of the 13 points, I believe in the Messiah. So, so this is coming from Musa ibn Maymun. By the way, one interesting thing about Rambam, Wallahi, he's so ironic, so ironic. He became the best physician of his time because he mastered Ibn Sina. So he read Ibn Sina, he mastered Ibn Sina. Now he's the best physician. He works his way up. Guess who he becomes the personal doctor to? None other than Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi takes him as his personal court doctor. For a period of time, he travels with Salah al-Din. He is the primary doctor of Salah al-Din Ayyubi. Nobody can accuse our religion of anti-Semitism. Nobody can accuse our sultans, our khulafa of hating people because of their different faith. It didn't happen that way. If you were talented, you were the best doctor. And it's so ironic. Salah al-Din is conquering Jerusalem and Rambam is is his main doctor subhanallah how can we not remind our jewish brethren of this reality look at from where to where look at the past and now look at how that has flipped eventually he, he went to egypt he lived in egypt by the way he wrote most of his writings in which language arabic the chief rabbi of judaism is writing his books in arabic this is well known you can see them and look look at them online and he has a book called the guide of the perplexed and there are a number of papers about this, that this is coming straight out of Al-Ghazali's Al-Munqid Min Al-Dalal. Literally, Imam Al-Ghazali wrote Al-Munqid Min Al-Dalal. And there is a book that he wrote for his people, The Guide for the Perplexed. And it has the same motifs, the same notion. Again, it's not copy-paste, because in the end of the day, he's an intellectual thinker. But he takes ideas, he takes notions from Islam, and he judaizes them which is what we expect to do but where is the origin what's the kernel from our faith tradition it is true to say it is true to say that never in the last 2000 years before the creation of this country has the jewish people flourished as they did under muslim spain under islamic andalusia their greatest minds their largest synagogues you can visit their synagogues to this day in qurtuba in granada they still have their synagogues that were built not under the christians 
under the Muslims. Where, now in 1492, Ferdinand Isabella come, the first decree, all Jewish people will leave or convert or die, be killed. Where did these 500,000 Jewish people go? The Sultan Muhammad II gave a decree. Anybody who flees from Andalusia shall be welcomed in our lands anywhere you are. And he said, any vizier, any governor, any businessman who impedes their settling, who stops them to settle in any city, shall be punished by the Sultan himself. Sultan Mehmed II welcomed hundreds of thousands of Jewish people in 1492 with open arms. He literally saved them from execution or forced conversion. And he was angry at Ferdinand and Isabella. And he goes, this is not a good policy. But he thanked them. He goes, but you are giving us your good minds, your good workers. Don't worry, we will take them. Because of this, sisters and brothers, where did they go? They ended up in Morocco, in Tunisia. They ended up in Egypt. Hundreds of thousands of large Jewish communities were living in the Middle East, in Yemen. They were living there because Ferdinand and Isabella expelled the Jewish people. Muslims welcomed them and they said, Tafaddal, come and live here. And they lived here up until 1947. And by the way, before we even get to 1947, let's not forget another chapter in Muslim Jewish history. And this one, I was honestly surprised when I found out under Nazi rule. When you're all aware what Hitler did, he made a policy, all the people of that background shall be exterminated. The most inhumane, barbaric policy in the entire history against uh, the Jewish people was Hitler. He literally exterminated them by, you know, gas uh, uh, chambers and whatnot. Guess who intervened where possible? In multiple countries, Muslims, sometimes at risk to their own lives, stood up and protected Jewish people. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, I say to you honestly, I have visited Auschwitz and Dachau. I have studied this chapter in history. Wallahi, I swear to you, if I were alive at that point in time, I would hope to Allah that I have the courage and bravery to stand up against the tyrant of tyranny of Hitler and to protect innocent women and children. The way they were brutalized, the way they were rounded up and just killed for no reason. The innocent babies we saw thousands of toys and thousands of shoes of children literally just piled up there kill for no reason i would hope i would have that courage as well and i was so happy to hear so many people stood up the sultan of morocco interesting morocco was under the french rule and so technically it was not independent yet when the french said give us your jewish people sultan muhammad v said no way these people are our brethren they have lived with us for centuries they shall not be handed over so Sultan Muhammad refused to obey the Nazi policies under uh, the, the French rule of the, of the Nazis. Tunisia as well refused. The Ottomans refused. In Bosnia, the Muslims refused. And perhaps the most brave act of courage, because it wasn't a government, it was brave. In France, the Muslims who were under the Nazi occupation. So the Nazis, if you remember your history, they invaded France and they took it over. So you have Nazi rule in France for a few years. You literally had Nazis ruling France before the liberation in 1947. So Nazis are in control. Muslims were allowed to live as second-class citizens. The Imam of the Masjid, Bulqadir, the Imam of the Masjid, the Grand Mosque of Paris, I visited it. It's a very beautiful masjid built in the 1930s. It's still standing to this day. It's a beautiful, iconic masjid in Europe. The Imam of the Masjid gave a secret talk to the Muslims. And he encouraged the Muslims, if you know any Jewish friends of yours, bring them in. We will protect them in our mosque. The basement of the Masjid became a home for the Jews under Nazi rule in France. And this was engineered by the Imam, the Sheikh. And some people were, didn't have space. He forged Islamic documents 
and told them to dress like Muslims. And it is said he saved over a thousand people by this policy. A thousand Jewish people in France were saved by the Muslim community who literally banded together. They didn't tell any secrets. There were families in the basement of the masjid and those that didn't have space, the Imam personally forged IDs that these are Muslims. Because you know, in the end of the day, what do the Nazis know? They look different, they talk different, they dress different. Khalas, they pretend to be Muslims. Muslims. This is what you call Islamic rule. This is what is akhlaq of the Muslim. When this tyrant comes, you're not going to allow him to do this. You will protect them. And so it is truly sad that all of this history has been completely forgotten. What happened? Obviously, you're aware in 1947, it is estimated there were around less than a million uh, Jewish people living in Arab and Muslim lands, less than maybe 900,000. That's a huge number, by the way, especially after World War II. After World War II, you had more Jewish people across the Middle East and Arab lands than anywhere in Europe, right? So almost a million living in Yemen, in uh, Cairo, in Iran, in uh, Morocco. These are all people of, of, of Jewish background. What happens in 1947, the, the, the country of Israel is formed and they make a call, a plea, that if you come here, you will be given perks and land. If you come here, you'll be given a better economic status. And so majority of them migrated. Why did they migrate? Put yourself in their shoes. It's their land from their perspective, obviously. They're getting their own people. They're getting a citizenship. They're getting uh, land. They, they feel it's going to be safer for them. Some of them believe in, in Zionism. And yes, I'm not going to deny, because of the atrocities in 1947 and the massacres against Arabs, it is true in a number of Muslim lands for the first time in history, these types of sentiments that we now are familiar with began to develop against the Jewish population. I'm not going to deny this, but why did it happen? Because of politics of Israel, not because they were Jews, because Israel massacred thousands, hundreds of thousands of Muslims, expelled hundreds of thousands of Arabs. Well, then there's going to be a feeling of sentiment. Why are you guys doing here go where you belong and whatnot so all of this put together in the next five to ten years from 900,000 Jews in Arab and Muslim lands currently it is estimated there are less than 15,000 across all lands 200 here 500 here all of them have come to Israel but one final point and with this we conclude subhanallah this is something you need to know O Muslims this division of living under Muslim living under Christian it had and has and continues to have a profound impact on the demographics of the country of Israel. Judaism is divided into multiple groups. The three most important groups, number one, Ashkenazi, number two, Sephardim, number three, Mizrahi. These three divisions go back to whether they were living under Europe or under Muslim rule. And the most Europeanized Jewish people are the Ashkenazis. These are the ones they never lived under Muslim lands. These are the ones they have a different cultural background. They're more European. Generally, they're more secular. Generally, they're the ones in charge. Generally, they're socioeconomically privileged. And they're the governments ever since the founding of Israel. Sephardim are those Jewish people that were kicked out of, kicked out of Andalusia. And Mizrahi are the Jewish people who lived in Arab lands, Yemen, Iran, other places for many millennia. They are the smallest. Generally, Sephardim and Mizrahi are more pious. They're more orthodox. They're more religious. They're more believing in God. And a lot of you don't know this. In Israel, they are treated like second-class citizens. In Israel, because they can tell by your looks, they can tell by your name, they can tell by your culture. The Ashkenazis who have a white skin color are the superior class. And of course, there's even a lower category, the Falasha, which are coming from Ethiopia. And you should see how they are treated in uh, Israel. They are the lowest of the low. But above them are the Mizrahis and above them are the Sephardim. Sephardim and Mizrahis, they are ghettoized in Israel. In the 40s and 50s, they were not given the land they were promised. They were not given the perks that the Ashkenazis were given to. They were not given government positions. And this caused, I'm not joking, you can look this up. In the 60s and 70s, political parties, some of them semi-violent from the Sephardim, from the Mizrahi, were formed to fight against whom? 
Against whom? The Arabs? No, Ashkenazis. To fight for their rights. And these days there is a massive um, party in, in, um, uh, in Israel called the Shas party. S-H-A-A-S, the Shas party. It is the fourth or the fifth largest party. It is a party that was founded to protect the rights of the Arab Jews, i.e. the Sephardim and the Mizrahi Jews. So that they have equal rights as the Ashkenazis. You have to realize racism is rampant in that group of people, even amongst their own. Any Jewish person who lived in Muslim lands, who spoke Arabic, who comes from an Arabic culture, is not treated with the same respect as the Europeans. And this is well known, open secret. Go look it up, go do your research in this regard. So this is one point. And then I want to conclude on this point, sisters and brothers, and that is that we are not mentioning this. Wallahi, we are not mentioning this to remind them of a debt they owe us. No, we did this because Allah told us to do it, not because of them. We did this because our Prophet taught us this is how we treat minorities. We would do it all over again. But we just want to show the world this is Islamic law, this is Islamic Sharia, the freedoms that they had, the intellectual you know, curiosities, the, the books that they produced, they couldn't produce a fraction of them in Europe in medieval times. And that is what we give to the world. It is truly sad. And we don't say this as a debt or a favor. We're just pointing out the facts. It is truly sad that the same descendants of those whom we saved, those who were given refuge with us, they have flipped the script and they are doing what Hitler did to them, they are doing to the very people who protected them. And we just say this as a historical fact and record, otherwise we complain to Allah and Allah alone. These are facts we should all know, and we are proud as Muslims of our history, and we're proud of our Sharia, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, and inshallah we'll continue in the same vein. Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let the power of media improve your connection to your deen and make a positive impact on your life. Download the One Islam TV app today and embark on a transformative journey of knowledge, inspiration, and spiritual growth.